Uh, good morning. Uh, David, <clears throat> uh, since we were last on stage together, uh, you've become a new father, and that uh, child has gotten 218 million visitors, according to YouTube. Um, tell me. Well, you're referring to the baby panda. I am. Um, yes. Um, the baby who, who wouldn't be alive without David? So. Well, I don't know about that, but uh, they did tell me that it was likely that they would need artificial insemination uh, to produce a, a baby panda because the pandas tend to fight for the four-hour period of time when they can mate and actually reproduce. So after the first two hours of fighting, they decided to artificially inseminate the female, <laughs> and they wanted to know whether I wanted to go watch the artificial insemination. I said, absolutely not. Uh, they said, do you want to see the semen extracted from the male? I said, no, absolutely not. I don't want to see that either. Um, but the artificial insemination worked, as you know, and now we have a, a new baby panda uh, that the first lady saw last Friday and named, um, new name. And uh, as a result of that, um, we have a panda that everybody seems to like, weighs about five pounds now, very healthy, and you're referring to the fact that uh, he sneezed yesterday and the world seemed to pay attention to that. It is amazing that when the government has it shut down, the greatest complaints seem to come from the fact that the panda cam is shut down as opposed to the social security checks not coming. <laughs> right. Um, on the 60 Minutes profile, which was done recently, uh, you talked about patriotic philanthropy, which you can define for us. And then tell me how the pandas fit into the patriotic philanthropy and the, okay, the well, semen extraction in particular. Um, I don't know about that as being patriotic, but I would say... Uh, the, the National Zoo is actually owned by the Smithsonian, has always been. And so as a region of the Smithsonian, when I learned that the uh, pandas needed some funding to keep them here, I decided I would um, help them with that. But it's really, um, my view is patriotic philanthropy um, is a little bit of a misnomer. I maybe coined the phrase, but all philanthropy is patriotic. If you're doing any philanthropy, you're obviously helping the country, you're helping your community, so it's all patriotic. What I was trying to do in defining the, that, that phrase is, is uh, say, things that particularly relate to so helping the U.S. government and things that it can't afford to do anymore or helping remind people of our heritage and our traditions. And so that's what I really was referring to. In their ca that case, I was helping with the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian gets about 60 percent of its budget from the federal government, but 40 percent comes from contributions and philanthropy and so forth, and that was in that context. Um, some of your projects uh, are a great success, like the pandas. Uh, how is it doing to educate members of Congress about history, your Library of right. Congress dinners. Well, what you're referring to is this. Um, I thought it would be a good idea to get members of Congress to come together in a nonpartisan way, which it rarely happens. Un unlike the pandas. Right. No fighting. Well, partisan uh, you know, things are very common in Washington, but I thought I have an interest in history, and I thought what, what, I, what I would try to do is this. I organized a dinner at the Library of Congress where I would interview a great presidential scholar about a president, typically a deceased president, who is not that controversial. So Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, so forth, and, and, and have a dinner for the members. Before the dinner, we would have them gather uh, Democrats and Republicans, senators and House members, and see documents from that era, and then go down, have a dinner, and they tend to sit with members of the opposite party, which rarely happens. And then... Um, uh, I would interview the scholar, and then the members would ask questions, and there's no press there, so nobody is preening for the cameras or anything. And now, after about a year and a half, some members of Congress say, me, this is the most interesting thing that they're doing in Washington, which is a sad commentary, maybe, because <laughs> you'd think that passing legislation would be more interesting. But some members bring their wives in from wherever they might, their district might be, and they have it as a date night, because they say it's a rare time when you can actually have a social uh, event in Washington, actually learn something, spend time with members of the opposite party, and not be criticized for anything. So it's worked out pretty well, and we'll continue doing it. And the next one, I think, will be, we just had uh, Ron Chernow, who did the book on, um, on, on Alexander Hamilton, now it's in the play, and the next one will be Robert Caro, who did a four-volume series so far on Linda Johnson. Yeah. So before we get to how you made your money, um, uh, you're a, 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 an early signator of the Giving Pledge. Yes. Um, how do your children feel about your already deciding to give away most of their inheritance? Well, the presumption is that if parents have money, it will go to their children, and that's a presumption a that presumption. Some, some people make, yeah. but it's not necessarily the case. There's no evidence, as I've probably said before, that if a child inherits $500 million, that child is going to go do something that's going to win a Nobel Peace Prize or some other Nobel Prize. Uh, inheriting a lot of money, you can joke about it, but it's a bit of a burden. And if people think you've got money and you didn't do, didn't do anything in your life to earn that money, uh, 
people aren't going to probably respect you as much. So the idea that I've had is to kind of have, make sure my children are fully formed before they really um, you know, feel that they, they're going to get any money from me, and they probably won't get any anyway, because if I've given them a good education, and my wife and I have given them a good education, that's all they really need. They need unconditional love from their parents, a good education, a good start, but they don't need staggering sums of money to be successful. Most people that do great things in the world, I think, are, come from <laughs> modest backgrounds. And, you know, I, I don't want to say the people inherited $500 million or, or a billion dollars are not great people, but generally, if you look at the people that win Nobel Prizes or or MacArthur Genius Grants, they aren't people that inherited staggering sums, so it's a bit of a burden, and uh, my children are quite fine with it, and uh, I don't see any problem with it. There are 40 of us who signed it initially. Um, they're now about 140. We just celebrated the fifth anniversary of it, and uh, we'll probably come to Washington in the late year, uh, late, later this year to come to have some event marking the fifth anniversary of it. Have you given away any money you'd like to have back? <laughs> I've invested some money in deals I'd like to have back. <laughs> um, um, there are people who give away money and who are very uh, intense with looking at metrics and very uh, much on top of the people they've given the money to. I tend to be a little bit more laid back, and I'm not saying the first method is bad, but my method is to try to give people money uh, that gets, give me some reports. I'm trying to I generally be easy about it. I don't really regret anything I've done. Some has been more effective than others, and I've been surprised, honestly, most of my money, to be serious, has gone to education and medical research, but the patriotic philanthropy has gotten more attention because very few people are doing that. Lots of people are giving money to education and, and higher education and uh, medical research. So if you give a large grant there and maybe something good happens, it doesn't get as much attention, though attention isn't the most important thing. But if I give uh, $7.5 million to the Washington Monument, people keep mm -hmm. talking about that, even though, relatively speaking, it's a modest amount relative mm -hmm. to other things I've done. Well, it is high profile. It is high profile, and I enjoyed you know, climbing to the top of it and uh, putting my initials on the top of it when nobody was looking. <laughs> so uh, what's your mother most proud of? Well, my mother is Jewish, and, and um, I would say, you know, Jewish... If only you'd been a doctor. Right. She did want me to... <laughs> She did want me to be a dentist. She thought that was the highest calling of mankind. You get to be called a doctor. You don't have weekend hours and no emergencies and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I kept saying, suppose I get arthritis in my fingers. What will I do? My career will be gone. So I talked her out of my being a dentist. My mother is uh, shortly going to be 85 years old. And uh, she's, um, you know, most mothers are probably pleased with their children. I think she's probably pleased. But the thing that is most interesting is when I was building Carlisle, and making some money. She never would call me and say, I'm really proud of your building this company because she didn't really know much about private equity. Now that I'm giving away a fair amount of money, she actually calls me and says, I'm much more proud of what you're doing now than when you're making the money. So mm -hmm. that makes you feel good. And I use the, what I call the mother test. If my mother calls and is proud of what I'm doing, then I think I did a good thing. Well, we don't have much money, uh, much money left. We don't have much time left. <laughs> I never have much money left. Um, as chairman of the Kennedy Center, who picks the honorees? Um, it is a mysterious process that nobody really understands, no. Um, I would say for the first 37 years or so, George Stevens um, uh, largely picked them, and I did a very, very good job of doing it. There was a committee of artists. the producer, we have a new producer, and we have a process where people can recommend from all over the country. We then have a committee of, of distinguished artists, Julie Andrews or Yo-Yo Ma are on it. They make recommendations. And the president and the chairman and, and some other members of the executive committee try to put together a slate that has a lot of balance to it. So it's a combination of many different people looking at it. Uh, do you have any desire to return to government? Well, I got inflation to 19% when I was a young man in the Carter White House. And since those days, there has never been any single uh, offer for me to go back. Um, and I've been waiting. You know, when, when Ben Bernanke was chairman of the Fed, he used to complain about a potential deflation problem. And I said to him at the time, I can come back and get inflation back for you. But he didn't invite me back. Uh, no, I think it's uh, unlikely that uh, I will go back in government. Uh, uh, right now, I, I think that you can probably do as much on the outside as on the inside. So... I'm happy with where I am, and I just, you know, my most important thing is hoping I have the health to do what I want to do. And, you know, I'm now 66 years old, and, you know, when you turn 60, people begin to look at you differently. They say, well, you look good today. Um, 
and at the Kennedy Center, they, the young women that escort me around from events, they say, well, Mr. Rubenstein, these are six steps. Can you walk up these six steps, or do you want to take the elevator? So you, people look at you differently, and clearly when you turn 60, you realize you've lived more than you're going to live. When you turn 50, you can pretend you've got 50 to go, but when 60, you can't pretend you've got another 60. So I am racing through life now to try to do the things I want to do because I now have access to things I didn't have before, or access to people or money, and I just don't want to waste any time. So I'm, I'm racing through life, sprinting to the finish line, I call it, and I just hope that I um, am luckier than some of my colleagues. I read my, in the obituaries every day, first thing in the morning, to see who died that I know <laughs> and see how come I'm so lucky because I'm older than some of the people that died. So I don't <laughs> want to be, read my obituary anytime soon. Well, um, we've run out of time, <laughs> not existentially, just okay. in this. Thank this, you. Right? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to escort David to the elevator. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.